record still. There's no camera, but still record is good. So the first uh, model is called uh, Deep Feature Learning from Video Sequences. So you know this model is on video. But today I'll talk about, uh, res uh, I, I probably say like a very hard research topic that uh, requires some, first some understanding about what is unsupervised learning. So the first question, like, ha have you had any lecture or module on unsupervised learning? No, okay, cool. But you've, you've done generative models, which at least one can think that they are training unsupervisedly, but it, that's fine. So I'll, I'll first explain what unsupervised learning is and what are the, what is, I think, the basic architecture for deep learning in unsupervised learning, and then we see how this paradigm for learning is, can be a, exploited with videos, because we are in M6, which uh, um, focuses on videos. And when I said videos, so he, he, uh, so I said video sequences mean like, actually like only the visual parts, so only the, the sequence of, of video frames. And next week, we'll think like, what if, apart from the visual part, what if we also have the audio tracks from videos? But that will be next week. So first, let's define what unsupervised learning is. Uh, so first, there are many slides from Kevin McGuinness from DCU, and in case you want to learn with a bit more detail, we have this uh, previous video recordings from lectures on unsupervised learning. So I'm um, not really sure, have I ever shown you this slide, this cake? How many of you have you seen it in the past? Nobody? Okay, so that's the most famous cake in, on deep learning, okay? That's a type of cake called Black Forest, and that's the cake that Yale Kuhn uh, uses when normally when he speaks, when he starts uh, many of his talks. And he refers like about uh, different types of learning and how efficient they are in terms of data, okay, data efficiency for, for learning. So we know that to, I'm going to talk about deep learning and in order to estimate all these millions of parameters for the networks, we need data. And depending on how much, so based on the, an amount, so given an amount of data, like let's see how, how much, uh, how efficient it is in terms of estimating parameters and also in how, many, how much data we have, that, that also depends on the type of learning we, we are running. So I think yesterday you had a lecture on M5. Those of you who are in F M5, I think you had reinforcement learning or Monday? Okay, cool. So reinforcement learning is the cherry of the cake. This means like if in a cake, the, ch the cherry is like very, very, very super small part, which kind of means here is like this reinforcement learning means that, okay, so you're going to generate a huge amount of data, uh, typically with the simula simulator, and you're going to spend a lot of computation on running your simulator, and just and, uh, at the very, very end, after all this data generated, you will just get a, a very small amount of feedback, uh, uh, a, a small label saying, okay, yeah, did it, you did well or you did wrong. That's, for those of you who were in the lecture from Adriana Romero, that's kind of the, the reward, okay? so. Uh, you get like so little for, for so much data. So you also have get, get a few bits for some, some uh, samples. Then there's a supervised learning, that's the one that we have probably been talking about in all over the, this master probably, when talking about machine learning, which mean okay, yeah. So we have um, your data and you have your labels and you want to learn this function f that will learn to map your input data to whatever output you want to predict, and hopefully you will do it in such a way that, that it generalizes well. And that's kind of the, the challenge we have. But we have pairs of uh, data samples and the expected lab label that, that you want your network to predict, and you have like some run through that you learn from. That's the supervised learning. And um, so in this, ca in this case, um, let's say you have uh, an image, and you have the category for, for the image. So the image, there's a lot of information in the image. There are like so many pixels and there's the RGB channel. So there's quite a lot of information, but in the end you'll get a, a label for that. Like a, yeah, cat, dog, okay? For those huge amount of pixels, you only have like one label. So that's more efficient than reinforcement learning actually. Uh, but maybe it's not the, okay, maybe we, we, can, we can, there are other ways to, to learn as well. And that's what, uh, Yalekun refers to when he talks about unsupervised uh, learning or predictive learning. And he, he, he talks a lot, about, a lot about predictive learning, which is, I, I will cover this, but there are other ways of unsupervised learning. The idea is, is that 
uh, you have data and you don't have labels. So, but then you take so you have data without labels, which is something that normally you have a huge amount. But then you use most of it, or you you are more data vision in, in that sense. Okay. The challenge is that you don't have labels, and then of course. Probably you, you should be wondering, like, hey, if I don't have labels, how, how I'm going to estimate my parameters? Because you have, oh, as far as I know, you have always seen like that you had like some label at the at the output, some value you need to predict, and then do the back propagation also. But okay, so the idea is that you have a huge amount of data and just a huge amount of data without labels, you can still learn interesting things. Yeah. Um, so that's what we are going to cover. Like, what if you have a huge amount of data and you want to learn something useful out of it? And that's actually what the matches very well, like for videos, because in videos that's probably the most pervasive data. So that's most of the internet now. The internet data that we transport it's it's video, and we have all these cameras. They are everywhere, and everybody has cameras on their uh, mobile uh, devices, phones, and there are all these uh, surveillance cameras and cameras everywhere. So we have really a huge amount of data. Uh, normally, the pain is to label that, but if we can do things without labeling then interesting things without labeling data, that's, that's a super rich source of information. So, uh, so that would be like the classic supervised learning you have seen so, so far, just to make sure that we are, we are all in the same page. So we have your training data, you have the pairs of uh, data and labels. We're going to learn uh, some function, f, had the model, so that in, when we have like new data, new test data, we want to predict the, the labels that should match with the with a x data on test time. In the case of unsupervised learning, we don't have these pairs of x, y, so we need to figure out how, how to learn something without having pairs of x and y, okay? So um, I'm going to focus on supervised learning. So actually what we do in unsupervised learning is we are trying to model the data distribution. So we have our x, let's say all the possible images in the wall, okay? And that's a, that's a, a distribution of data. Um, we want to model like this data distribution if, and if we achieve that you will see that we can do something interesting. For example, uh, when, when uh, Michal, I guess, uh, he told you, about, for those of you who are in M5, when he, Michal told you about generative models, you learned that if we can, in the end, so some of these generative models, they, they actually estimate the distribution that, so you learn that if you can estimate this, this distribution, you can then sample out of it and generate new samples that, new images that don't exist in, in the nature, okay? That's, that's one application, but there are some other ones. Okay, so there's a lot of interest now in, in supervised learning uh, in the community because actually that's, that's uh, many people argue that's, that's how we do most of our learning, that uh, we learn how the world works or we learn how to think not because we have a teacher like 24 hours over us like telling us, okay, yeah, that's, that's a table and that's a, that's a dog and that's whatever, but because we observe, maybe we experiment a little bit we, or a lot with our environments, we say, okay, what if I do this? Is it going to be good or wrong? Okay, and we figure out <laughs> if that's what we want it or, or not, okay? But, but it's not, so hopefully the, the idea is that if we have good teachers that we would learn faster, but if we had like an infinite amount of time in our life, maybe we would learn the same or even better things, right? But okay, we, teachers only what they do is they speed up because they, 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 they give the experience so you need to run all the experiments, right? But we can learn, learn, learn a lot without labels, without uh, any teaching. And if we could exploit, if we could manage like unsupervised learning and in the very end, uh, you know, like all this deep learning community or artificial inter uh, intelligence community, one of the final goals is to try to reproduce like what does a, an intelligent agent like a human uh, do. We want to do produce that. So if we want to, the idea is that if we want to really solve uh, artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, we should be able to have algorithms that learn the same way that we humans do. So we should have algorithms that learn without, without uh, somebody telling all the time without the teacher, like somebody telling like, yeah, this is, a, this is a doctor, that's a chair, that's a cat, okay, like all the time. And also because we have huge amount of data, especially in video, and that's why unsupervised learning for video, it's super, super interesting. 
Um, just, just imagine that you are doing uh, some Bayesian classifier, which is not what we're going to cover in this lecture, but just imagine if you want to do that and you want to apply the base rule. So um, learning the distribution of data would mean like uh, uh, learning the distribution of uh, P of, of X. And no knowing all this, that would help you in predicting like normally what you want to do, it's like to predict a, a label based on the data. Also, uh, you have, you have, I think you have for sure done already in another module, probably M3. They told you about back of visual words, I guess. So, um, so you, they told you that before all this deep learning craziness, uh, people used to have these uh, let's see, features and cluster them to create a vocabulary. And when you create a vocabulary, it's, you can think that it's kind of projecting, it's, it's, this is a way as if you are projecting your data in the higher dimensional space where classification is a bit easier. So here you have an example where you have like features in two dimensions and imagine that you run unsuper one unsupervised learning algorithm called clustering that you know what it is, okay? So you, you have your data and you say, okay, I want, I want uh, in this case, four clusters um, and, the data, and there are algorithms that cluster your data and based on that then you can uh, map all your input data into a, a dimensional space that it was originally two dimension. When you do this clustering, you can think that what you're doing is you are projecting your data in a four dimensional space. And maybe in a four dimensional space, like this problem of uh, classifying between blue and red samples, which is with a linear classifier, it's kind of impossible, or yeah, impossible to, to solve in a 2D space. If you, if you, if you map it into a four, four D space, then it's kind of, easy-ish, right? If you have like this kind of representations to discriminate between the blue and the, and the red because you see the two and four corresponds to the blue and one and three, clusters one and three correspond to the, to the red ones. So here the message what I want to, what I want to say is like uh, unsupervised learning, like clustering, you have already done it even if you were not aware of it when you were doing clustering and that can, and learning this kind of stuff, it can be useful, for example, to projecting your data in a, in a higher dimensional space where problems are easier to solve. That that's, was my message here, okay? okay? I think you know about this. Then something important when we do unsupervised learning is that we are going to do some assumptions, okay? And, and the case of, of image, I think that the assumption is quite kind of natural, let's say. Sorry, so there are different assumptions, like uh, typical ones is that the smoothness assumptions, like when you have points which are close to each other in your feature space, you are more likely to share the label. So if you, somehow you learn some features and, and you have a, you fit an image into your model and you get a feature in that high dimensional space and then you have another image, you fit into the same feature structure and that feature is very close to the, to the, to the previous one, to the one that was labeled like, like dog. So probably you can think that probably that new point that you want to label, it's probably will have this. The, the similar semant uh, semantic label if you do the, if you learn the right features. Um, also that you can think of, you, there are some assumptions like, okay, so uh, you can assume that your data in this magic feature space anomaly, that's what we do when you do learning, uh, will have like clusters that correspond to the semantic classes, for example, like when, when so that when we train neural networks, they will magically not magically, but okay. They will be able to map like uh, in this high dimensional space, like all, all semantic concepts in the same area of this high dimensional space. That's another assumption. And the one that probably we are going to, to uh, exploit quite a lot, it's the manifold function, which says that um, our data, um, which is images or video, um, lies approximately on a manifold on a man, much lower dimension than the input space. What does it mean? It means that imagine that you have, uh, in this case, uh, this uh, feature space of only two dimensions, okay? And maybe, and you have, this, uh, the blue will be like your blue data. Um, you, can, you can, sometimes what we do is like, we are going to assume that my data uh, lies in a linear, in this linear space, so whenever, whatever, uh, sample we have, we're going to project it into the into this to this line, and that's going to help us in solving another task. If the manifold is linear, and if it's not no linear, you can, we can also learn a nonlinear manifold. And whatever input data we have, we're going to map it 
to that manifold, that's going to help us a lot because because we, we, we whatever point we have anywhere in the two D space, we're going to map it into much uh, pre produced uh, to this manifold. So so that's um, it's going to simplify things. Okay, we we know that if we got a point over here, that we need to somehow map it over there and then take our decisions. Maybe we take a binary threshold here and we'd say, oh, well, everything on this side, it's cats and all, everything on that side are dogs, for example. But, and of course, then in that case, the problem is how do you learn uh, the parameters that allow you to define this nonlinear manifold in this case. The linear manifold, you know that it's kind of easy. Okay, and that's kind of what we do with images or video, if you want. I just consider now that an image is a 2D uh, signal, okay, and each pixel uh, is, a, is a dimension in that, uh, in a high dimensional space. So let's imagine you have a 10 by 10 image, and then, and then you, can, you can think that, uh, and by now let's, let's think about grayscale, you can think that this 10 by 10 image, uh, it's whatever image you have in there, it's a point in a 100 dimensional space. Yeah, you can think about this way, images like this way. And then, uh, so whatever image that you, you, that you, that you project into, into, one, into, whatever real image you project into this 100 dimensional space, uh, if, you, if you could paint it, that we're going to be somewhere in this high dimensional space. And the manifold hypothesis basically tells you that, okay, that if you have like, let's say, real images, or the, the hypothesis that we're going to exploit is that we have like real images, real images, let's say images taken with a camera, the, this 100 dimensional space is not going to be full everywhere, filled, sorry, filled everywhere, right? It's going to be kind of, all the images will be in certain locations of that space. Like m most of the, most of the combinations of the, of this 100 dimension, this 100 dimensional uh, feature representations uh, will not match to a real image. Most of them are going to be this noise, right? Okay, these, these are color images, so you can think that it's, 100 for, for each RGB channel. So you, if you want to think about 300 dimensional space, that's the same story. But m most of the positions in the 300 dimensional space that would correspond to a color image of 100 by 100 will, will never, uh, will never exist in the real world. Okay, just a, a small part of them. And that's kind of, so uh, assuming that, okay, not, not all of the positions, not all the positions are, are possible, we're going just to to, to try to model this manifold, like uh, in which areas of this high dimensional space we can have our data. That's one of the assumptions that we do, especially in, in deep learning. So, in, so learning this kind of, these manifolds, that's what you can think that deep learning uh, neural networks do. They learn representations. So whatever input you have there, it's going to be mapped into this, into our, our um, manifold that we learn. Um, in order to do that, uh, there are different architectures. So the, um, the most basic one, uh, it's this. So have you ever seen autoencoders in somewhere in this model, in this master? Where? In, in M5? Last year. And this year? In this year, no. Yeah. But this year, so last year M5, you saw it somewhere? This year M5. Okay, and wh what was the lecture? What the lecture was called? You don't know? Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, it's not, it's not that important. I mean, I, I can explain it in 10 seconds. Okay, so in case you were, were there or you don't remember, an autoencoder, it's, um, it's uh, architecture in which you have like some input data over here, just. You can think it's your image. Uh, here, in this example, you only have like one hidden layer, but the point is that the output you have, you want to predict exactly the same image. Yeah? Then, if you have seen that in M5, you should be able to answer this question super easily. Like, so, so why would somebody want to train a neural network that you fit data into a network and the output is the same data that you already had? Right? Why, why do you think that's interesting at all? Yeah, you could, you could use that to, to compress your data. It can be an image. So, so as, as, as you, let's say, you control uh, the amount of uh, 
hidden neurons on your network. You can say, okay, I'm going to, I have my image, I want to compress them to whatever size. Um, and I train an architecture that will, will do this task. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, do you have any other application that wouldn't be image compression? Yeah, that's that's kind of a related answer, and it's a, you say it's a it's a good description for an image. That's fine. That's correct. And now let's 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 develop a bit more. So just imagine that you we have a very good uh, descriptor or feature structure for an image. Okay. So what are we got? What can we do now with this feature structure? Yeah. Okay. So one, one I think one application. I'm not really sure. Do you have any lecture on retrieval, image retrieval, search, image visual search? No. No. Okay. So, for example, I'm uh, not sure if you were thinking about that. Uh, one classic uh, application would be: so I have my image, I generate my representation, my descriptor, and I have a large data set of images, and I want to to find images which are similar to to this one that I have. Okay. And if I try to do that with by with my uh, full scale image, probably that's going to be a very long vector. And if I if I want to compare with all the images in, in the in my data set, so one thing so if you enroll all the pixels of your let's say query image and let's assume that all the data set has the same size, you sh you could like compare vector by vector with an L two distance or L one distance or whatever distance. And you can you could try to find like the you could rank your data set from the most similar, so the, the smaller systems to the less similar. Okay, normally you can do that for search, and that would be okay. That could be an application because one interesting thing. It's kind of related to the co coding uh, compression because then you could control like how big is this vector that you're going to use to do the comparison because this comparison is going to be just if, if your data set is of images is very large, that's going to be many differences or multiplications. Okay, that's. It's important to have uh, small vectors. Good. Um, more so on that. So the application for retrieval search, it's it's fine. But the, basically, what you said is like uh, it's going to be a good descriptor, okay? And what else can we do? So if we have like very good descriptors, like for example, when you did when I was telling you talking about back of wars, in the end, that's what the back of war algorithm does. It's this. It generates it produces some descriptors, some representations, which are very suitable to do other tasks like. So what, what did you do with back of words descriptors? Image classification, anything else? No, but okay, but the, the idea is that you learn a descriptor that then you use it for another task, yeah? And that's, uh, most of the talk, the lecture will, will, will have this in mind, okay? So that so that we learn a descriptor. Oh, yeah. So we learn, let's say that, imagine that you have this autoencoder, so we have our data, we have our encoder, the encoder will be like, let's say this part, if it's only one layer, but you know we can have like as many layers as, as, we, as we want, we just, we will need to estimate the parameters, of course. But the encoder, we have the latent variable, we call it the representation feature, we call it descriptor, it's, a, it's the same. And then we have a decoder, which in, in this figure will be like the weights uh, from the hidden layer to the output layer. And this decoder reconstructs the input data. Yeah, this will be the scheme of the open out encoder. And we can define a loss between the input data and the reconstruction. And that mean that's, that's the idea of the, uh, of the autoencoder, okay, with, a, with another block-based representation. Now, going back to the idea that Okay, now we have, if this representation is very interesting, very good, has many properties, now what we could do is we can uh, train the encoder and the decoder, okay? We discard the decoder because we, we, don't, we are not interested in given a hidden state reconstruct the input data because we already have the input data, so that's not useful. It, it, that's only useful to estimate the parameters of the encoder and now, for example, uh, with this key representation, we have a classifier of for image classification for or whatever classification task or whatever task you can think about. 
and now we can have our predictions. And, and now uh, we could train, of course we, could, we should train uh, these parameters and, and we, we could also allow, if you do a deep learning, we could also allow uh, these parameters to kind of adjust to whatever task. We, we can freeze them or we can, if you, if you want you can think now that we freeze them, but it will also be possible to really, to really uh, and freeze them and also kind of uh, adjust them to whatever task you, prediction task you want to solve. Okay, then. So why do you think, so why do you think this approach will be useful at all, okay? Because then you would, then you would think, okay, that's fine, very nice scope, but why, why do I need to go through this? Why don't I just learn this and this and that's it, right? Well, why, why would I want to first do this autoencoding part and then, and then discard the decoder and now uh, train, because I still need to train a classifier here. Why would I be interested in doing this at all. Yeah. And and what is good from unsupervised learning? Yeah. Okay. So for for this second part, so so you, you need to answer this point number two, okay? <laughs> Train final task with few labels. The few is the important word. Okay? So the the typically what you have is you have a problem and you have very few labels. That's most of the problems you will face, that's what will happen, right? And then uh, you say, okay, I would like to train a deep neural network because I see in class that it's super good to solve all these problems very well, but I only have like 10 labels. And then you say, okay, I cannot train any deep network with that. So one, one option to explore is I, First, I train an auto encoder on my data. So, of course, assuming, so you have 10 labels, a few labels, but you have a large amount of data. So if you have, maybe you have millions of images, but only 10 of them were labeled, okay? But, but you, you have these 10 millions of images, or unlimited many images. Then if that's, if that's the case, you have many data and few labels, which is like the classic case, um, then that's when it makes sense. Because what you'll be doing, basically, you'll be learning an encoder uh, some weight in your deep neural network that is familiar, that it's uh, adapted to the data that has seen your data previously, and then it, it only it only needs to learn the classifier, the, if you want the decoder for the task that you want to solve, which might be challenging, but okay, but all this part is already done, and, and this is a small vector, okay? So that's, it, you, or at least you can control the dimensions here, so you can play a little bit, and that kind of, it can work pretty well. So we, it has been seen that this can work in, in many tasks. So ba basically the story that now I'll show you many examples is like, yeah, we train this, our neural network in a supervised way. We extract, so, so we train it in a supervised way for some task. Th this task is not useful at all, like an autoencoder by itself. Okay, maybe for compressions, but apart from this, like the task of reconstruct reconstructing the input data in general, okay, now you tell me that there are the noising things and blah, blah, but in general it's not the important thing. But um, the representations that we learn, they are better than any feature that somebody has thought about, any handcrafted feature that many researchers in the last 20 years have, have come up with, any, you know, like SIF. So you do this and you might have better features than SIF, which is, uh, could be not really sure if that's the case, but that's, that's a kind of the idea, yeah? Okay, so some first examples, and now we'll, of, of this paradigm uh, for video, because we are, have a model for, okay, so this paradigm, how we apply it for, for video. So one of, of the first words, it's from uh, Stanford, so maybe you've heard about Andrew Wangji, he's one of the, maybe you've seen some of, of his lectures, and in 2018, Sorry, 2011, so that's all before the, all the AlexNet hype, okay? So you see that it's a bit weird, or maybe you would not be familiar with all the concepts, but um, in, he, in, in his lab they train uh, not a neural network, but something called independent subspace analysis, which has some uh, commonalities with neural networks because it's, 
it's based on convolutions and pooling operations. So they use video as a volume, so as uh, with 2D and so to this will be like a, a volume of 3D volume. You have the two, 2D for space, a third dimension for time, okay? And they, lear they did this analysis, whatever it is, this ISA analysis, we, we need to get into that. And they visualized the features that were learned with this analysis. And they uh, found this, that the features that were learned were these ones, okay? And as, as you see, uh, these features, they are clearly like edge detectors, so the ones which are static, they really look like edge detectors, like the ones that you might uh, manually encode with uh, some uh, texture-based filters, like Hawk or Sift or whatever, but these, were these ones were learned automatically. Probably you also have seen that in the first layers of uh, convolutional neural networks, okay? But of course, as this is video, there's a third dimension, because he he here they are depicting, the remember that that, the, that these are volumes, but the third dimension is time, so they are just plotting the time here. And uh, they learn features, and they could visualize also the evolution in time, okay? I show this example as one of the first words on exploiting video for learning features. Again, and then if you read the paper, these features, they were used to solve another task, and these features, they were better than some other features that they were hand in, handcrafted, hand engineered, but these ones they were learned. That's the paradigm that I want to emphasize today. Yeah? Uh, some more recent works. Uh, this would be like an auto encoder. More or less, you have like this frame, frame one, okay? And you have, uh, you have frame one. You encode it. There's a non-linearity. Non um, you do some operations, and so you, you expect some features here, you decode it, so you reconstruct, so you can kind of uh, train um, these filters, so they use that to train, uh, to learn features. The, what it's kind, what's kind of new here is that, okay, they, they, it's not that they only use frame one, but they also use the next frame, so frame two, so just think that the, that the ball has moved, has shifted to the right, they also auto-encode it in, in this branch, okay? So from, from here, they, it's just like one auto-encoder, this is uh, an auto-encoder. You can think that there are like two different images by now. From, from what I explained, there's no video involved, okay? There are just two video frames that I have auto-encoded this way and this way. But then what was kind of novel for them is like, as they knew that these two frames, because they are in a video sequence, they are, they, or they assume that the, two frames, they are nearby in time, uh, in the pixel space, let's say, they assume that the representations, the ones that you have over here, this L1, whatever representation that is, they were, they should be kind of similar as well. And they introduce this concept of slow, slowness, so they kind of, they force or they, were, they, they don't allow uh, big changes of features in, in neighboring frames. And by doing that, they improve the features that were learned, the visual features that were learned. Yeah. So that's a way of exploiting the, the temporal sequences in video to obtain, to learn ver better visual features. Sure. Yeah, I guess let, let's, yeah, good question. Um, so let's, let's just start over here, I guess, I guess. Um, and just think that all of these, it's a, uh, yeah, maybe just think about uh, an AlexNet or VGG, one of the, these deep networks that you have looked at. Okay, you know, you know there are like many layers and there are like many parameters to learn there. And just imagine, so, there are many parameters to learn. Uh, but now just think about maybe you, I don't know, let's say we, you take the, for that architecture, you, you just, you, di di you discard the last, let's say, 10 layers, just, just given a random number, okay? And you train the first n minus 10 layers uh, as an autoencoder, okay? So you have many images, no labels, and you, and you train them. 
then you know all, all this all the parameters in this part of, of, of the whole architecture and maybe they will not be exactly they will not have exactly the same uh, they will not be exactly the same ones as if you train uh, uh, with the full architecture but they, they should be kind of a little bit similar so uh, if, if you have seen if you know you know that in the first filters there are like this edge detectors or so you, have you seen this okay so this, this have learning these edge detector filters the first layers probably with an unsupervised task with a reconstruction task probably something very similar will also be learned okay and then so just imagine that you can initialize the first uh, we said n and minus 10 layers of your network with an unsupervised task and now that you have it that you say okay you have here something that it's that it's not random it is that it's better than random okay now you now you have your your label data set and now you train the you, you put the, the the layers that you had removed and then you train the weight for these 10 last deepest layers with your uh, data set with your so the idea is that is that you should need uh, so you should need less data to train only the tell us layers that if you needed to train the whole architecture from scratch from everything random yes but but just again so but when you start using these images that have labels okay you will already have n minus 10 uh, layers that are not random and that are they, they should be close to what you would learn if you had like a, an infinite amount of data to train everything with your label data that's that's the idea yeah mm. okay so here they were exploiting the the fact that let's say neighboring frames should have similar features neighboring frames in time should have similar features learn features and this is another word that it's kind of kind of similar ish um, but it's just that they they use what well, they use maybe they use like a bit more um, mathematical um, restrictions to to enforce that the that the features that were learned they they were similar in in China okay good so from now I just uh, I just kind of really look at only at the feature level and and look of, of uh, look at the feature and, and maybe I talk I talk about I talk about the, the task of uh, of the encoding and now we're going to be a bit more imaginative and we're going to think about other tasks which are not auto encoder which are not like I feed my data and I want to reconstruct it but that may still uh, be useful and probably will be useful. Uh, for video yeah so when I have video like what kind of task what kind of unsupervised learning task uh, people are using to learn features from video so um, I, I split this part in two like predictive learning and learning by verifying um, but but basically but well, not I mean they, you could if you think that you can think that they could be all in one one single section but there are like many words on predictive learning so that's why I wanted to have it separately but in the end it's predictive learning it's just one more task that people invent okay so there are many material from my uh, former students but predictive learning um, so I'm going back to the Jan Lekun's cake and earlier pro maybe you don't have much time to read in detail but now I want you to focus on something it is like when he was referring to unsupervised learning he was kind of actually really pointing at actually he wrote like unsupervised slash slash predictive learning and then he wrote like predict future frames in video okay and because and that's kind of the one of the first tasks that that he proposed or his team proposed um, to learn features like given a video what you want to do is to predict the next frame yeah so 
by itself, that task, it's, again, it's not useful by itself. I mean, if you have a video, okay, um, le learning a, a, a model that will predict the next frame, uh, it's not very useful. And probably now the one who mentioned about the thing on coding, say, you could say, oh, but that's super useful for coding because then you, don't, you only need to, predict, to encode your error and I'm, I totally agree, okay? But let's say for the machine learning people, because these are the ones that is come from this community, they don't probably, they are not that concerned about that. Uh, they, are, they are more, or Yale Kuhn, uh, it's not that he's not interested in coding, but probably what, what, what he kind of, the, the idea here behind is like, is that we as humans, what we learn, like everything we learn, it's because we want to predict what's going to happen in the future, and we do things to maximize the reward, our reward, or our survival or our whatever instincts we have in the future. We want to predict what's going to happen in the future, we're going to do things in order that this future is good for us, okay? That's as a, as a concept for general intelligence. And that's why as a first task for predicting the future would be like predicting the future frames, yeah? There are some other, I don't know, some other argumentation that I've found about this. Uh, and there was a paper from also from Facebook Paris that they were predicting like the next frames in self-driving cars and they, they were claiming that if you could predict the next, what, what would be like the next frames in self-driving cars, maybe you, you could foresee potential accidents, okay? If you, could, if you can predict possible, plus possible futures, maybe you can take actions now to avoid a future crash, okay? But I'm not going to get into that, I just want to define the task and show you some, paper, some works on that and how to use it to, to learn features. Yeah, but if you want to do your master thesis on that, that's a very hot topic and there are many people trying to predict the future from videos. Okay, so that's one of the uh, first works here. Um, so you have um, this sequence of frames, that would be like the input sequence of frames, P1, P2, and P3, hope you can see it. And here, uh, the goal is to learn a very good feature um, for the sequence, okay? And you can think about that this is a recurrent neural network. I know that you had a lecture on Monday, I think, from Adriana, so you should be familiar with that. Uh, if you weren't there or you don't really remember much, it's just a, a neural network that cannot remember what it has in a neural neuron that remembers what it has seen, so it has some memory. So if you feed that a sequence of frames, it kind of should remember the whole sequence in, a, in an ideal case, in a, an ideal world, which is not the case, but okay, let's assume we are in that direction, okay? So this, this direction of the figure is time, okay? So that's time step one, time step two, time step three. These are, you can think about these are like video, uh, video frames, one, two, and three. And we want to learn representation, and from that representation, what do you want to do? So one basic task would be like the autoencoding task, which is like this branch over here that says copy. Okay, so I'll copy this representation. And what, what do you have here? What is V3 hat and V21 and V1 hat? What are they? No, so, so if this is V3, so what is V3 hat? So if these are video frames, one, two, and three, and we are, so what, what are, what is V3 hat? And, I'm, and I'll tell you like this kind of an autoencoder, what is V3 hat? The? The decoder. So the decoder is? Decoder. Decoded, the reconstructed. So V3 hat, if everything works super well, it should be very similar to V3, yeah? So if, if we learn super good weight for our, our recurrent network, V3 should be sub very similar to this V3 or identical. This V2 should be identical to this one. This V1 identical to this V1, yeah? So this will be like the autoencoder part. And then in this work, uh, what they do, like the novel part is this branch where they copy. And over here you have like V4, okay? And V4, what, what is V4? It's the next frame. So this B1, B2, B3. C can you read the numbers or, yeah? And before we'll be like, what will be the next uh, frame? Yeah? And you, you, you can 
that's a task you can define, and you can learn your weights to do that. This weights W3, which will be similar. So the, the decoder W2 will be different to the decoder W3, because this one is reconstructing, this one is predicting the future. Yeah? So you, we can define a task to do that. And, so, um, and of course, this is going to be challenging, not saying that this works super well. But um, that's the kind of results they obtain. So if you have like these input sequences, one or this one, that's the kind of, when you do the autoencoding part, that's the ones that you would decode. Yeah, you see that it's blurrier. Yeah, and that's, that's quite common because normally when you go into a bottleneck, uh, sorry, in the, yeah, the bottleneck normally it's a representation. So the, the input, it's a, the, the whole image and, and you're going to encode everything in a, in a lower dimensional representation. Uh, it's quite common that you, if you only do, if you only, you only do this, you go to a bottleneck and then you try to decode, decode to the deconvolution, you're going to obtain blurry images. And uh, for the task of feature prediction, that's what, that's what they obtain. Um, so this is, will be the ground truth feature, okay? And that's the kind of feature that predicted that you can think about that there are some, it seems that the network is really trying, it's really capturing the dynamics. You see that in the ground truth, the six and zeros, they, they get together over here. They have this tendency of getting together and that's something that the network clearly kind of captures. It's blurry, but kind of captures the dynamics. It, it, allow, it, it learns to predict where the six and the zero are going to move in the future, more or less. Okay. <laughs> but that's okay, that's from 2015. Now, now there are like many, but, but still remember that the goal is not to predict the future. The goal is to learn a representation. Yeah, it's also, that's also quite important. Um, okay, that's the kind of results that you see in these kind of papers. They, they tell you that uh, for some other data sets, have you heard about UCF 101? It's a video data set for activity recognition. So uh, they, they, they compare what happens with, uh, with the features, with their model, with some, some baselines. Okay, then uh, going back to Yale Kuhn, Yalukan, who was the, this author that kind of shows the, the cake. Uh, he, his team also made a similar work. In this case, he, they use a convolutional neural network and they did some tricks. Actually, they also introduced something called multiscale architecture, which is not that interesting for us now, but, but they use it. And here, I want you to see the, the results. So these are, will be like the input frames of a video sequence. This will be the ground truth. So this will be like the next frames that should be predicted. And, and then th what it is, is they experimented with different losses to, to train the network. They train with L2 loss, the, and you see like the, so this is like one frame and another one. So you see like the, the more in the future you go, the more blurry it becomes, okay? L2 loss, uh, L1 uh, loss, then here they started like doing some uh, image gradient different loss, which means that I guess that they, they compute the loss in a, not in the pixel space, but in, a, in the gradient. They did, that's the interesting thing, they did some uh, adversarial training, which could be like a loss function that Michal explained yesterday. And that's, the one, that's, where, that's when they obtain um, better results. So normally, when you, you, when you do this type of thing of predicting the feature, which is similar to generating a new image, yeah, adversarial loss, this help a lot. Yeah, so you show the, the when you train, you show the right, fr the right frame, the, the, because you have the whole video sequence. You have a discriminator to whom you show the real next frame or the one that your network is synthesizing. And then you propagate the gradients. Okay, there's, I think the video is not working, but there are this famous scary kit. Oh, is that okay? No. I think it's over there. No. That's it, yeah. That's a scary kit that everybody knows about. It's when it's red, I think that it's predicting. Yeah, I think it's predicting frames. Okay. You see, our results are not super impressive, at least these ones, but that's from 2015, which is a long time now for deep learning. Okay, something a bit a bit uh, more recent. 
Um, there's this work that, um, apart from, so what they do is they use the task of predicting the next frame in a video to learn some representations which are super cool because, so they learn a video representation that has two parts. So an image, I mean, sorry, an image representation if you want, that has two parts. One part encodes uh, the content, which means like the kind of object that you will have. You see like maybe that's a, a van, an ambulance, a plane, say that's also a plane, a plane uh, tiger, uh, whatever animal, a person, yeah, another plane. Yeah, so these are different classes, yeah? And there's a, uh, so I'm going to show you the architecture, but the architecture, it learns a feature in which one part of the feature, like from position one to the position, you know, whatever, 200, that encodes what kind of object there is. And the rest of the feature vector, let's say from position, position 200 to 300, I'm inventing totally the dimensions. What it, in, what it encodes, it's the object pose with respect to the camera. It, it kind of spread in the rotation. Yeah, so the, the network is trained so that the, this feature has these properties. In order to train it, that's what I want to, what's interesting, um, I can show the results here. So when it's in red, it's predicting frames. So the first network it's DRNet, that's the one that you are looking at. And the uh, one on the right, it's MCNet, it's another model from the state of the art. So these frames in red, they are being, they are predicted, okay? By using this approach. By using these features that they are called disentangle. Disentangle means that the feature you can really give an interpretation of what's, what's in the feature. You can say, hey, this is the, the, the object class, and that's the, the position. The position of the camera, or in this case, the position of the, of the person. And, okay, there should be, there's a slide missing, but don't worry, because I have the, I just had the, oh, come on. Uh, okay, that's what I wanted to show you. I'm sorry uh, that I missed the, the page. But that, that's the one that, that's the architecture that you should understand now. So what it's doing, it's, um, here you have XT, that's the, um, that's a video frame at time step t, and you want to predict uh, the video frame and time step t plus one, okay? And what the a recurrent network is predicting, okay? It's this green part. So this is the feature vector. The orange part encodes the, the object class, let's say. The, and the green part encodes the pose, or in, if you want, on the example we saw, yeah, the pose of the person, okay? So, so in such a way that the video reconstruction, so t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, blah, blah, the only part you are predicting is the pose. The LSTM is only predicting the pose. The, the content, it's, a sta it's always static, it's the same. Yeah, and I think that if you can learn features this way, in a supervised way, uh, that's, that's a great way because then you can really synthesize new poses for whatever objects. So you say you, you encode the object in the, this first part of the feature, and then you and then you you can manipulate the the feature that does the the pose and generate new video frames or images if you want, multi-view images. Yeah, that's a nice part of this work. I will add this uh, architecture. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do. I think I will leave it here now to do the break, okay? And this part, we're going to finish it actually next week because um, I want to do the other part. <laughs> um, but the, the basic ideas is, I already presented them. Um, what it's left are like more tasks that people have invented with video to learn features in an unsupervised way. Okay, we're going to, to explore them next week, but I think the basic message, you, are, you already get it. Yeah, so different tasks from predicting the next frame. People have tried many crazy things. Okay, so let's have the 10 minutes break now, so we start at uh, 20 past five.